Vader, til bedre i eget spørgsmål, det er sådan, det er amen. I'm actually filling in this this uh, today for Father Jackson. He's returning from a uh, retreat, so he'll be taking the 8.30 uh, beginning tomorrow. Uh, but at least for today, we'll hear a little bit about our Saint, uh, Saint Peter of Alcantara. Uh, first, though, I'd like to mention a little bit about Saint Luke. Uh, his feast day was yesterday, the 18th. And as we know, Saint Luke was one of the four evangelists writing the gospel, which bears his name. Uh, and he, he learned of the Gospels from St. Paul, whom he accompanied on his journeys and is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. So St. Luke, I recall, wrote both the Gospel of St. Luke and he also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, he was a physician by trade and uh, in his writings, in his Gospel writings, it's interesting you get specific uh, medical terms that he uses that nobody else, none of the other Gospel writers use. So it, it, it corroborates that um, uh, Um, what we know about him, that he was a physician. Uh, also, he's very interested in the healing miracles. He goes into a lot of details in, in the, many of the healing miracles because he was a physician. Also, he gives us the most detailed account we have of the infancy narrative of Christ about his birth and so on. St. Luke is very interested in that. Uh, so Peter of Alcantara, uh, born in the year 1499 in Spain, and he was a hermit, a mystic, reformer of the Franciscans, and a friend to Teresa of Avila and St. Francis Borgia, among others. Uh, so um, very interesting, kind of like a, uh, this weird cross between a, uh, like a Franciscan monk, a desert hermit, and then a founder, and then a reformer, as we'll see. You know, quite, quite the interesting life. So as I mentioned, he was born in Spain, 1499, to noble parents. His father was governor of the city of Alcantara, And he was very pious as a child, and, and the, the family had servants, you know, they were very wealthy, uh, but uh, Peter was very, um, uh, just more concerned with prayer. Sometimes the, the servants would have to, like, shake him to get his attention uh, out of prayer. Uh, he received an excellent education, and by the age of 16, had graduated from the University of Salamanca. He joined the Order of Franciscans right away, and uh, by the time he was 22 years old, he was sent uh, to found a new community of Franciscans in a nearby city. He was ordained a priest at 25 years old and uh, lived a very penitential life, uh, very, uh, did the harsh physical penances, uh, wore a belt with, with iron, um, iron studs turned inwards, so that was irritating constantly. Uh, and he suffered, interestingly, uh, from a greater than usual sleepiness. He was always falling asleep, and so he resolved to make his particular penance, and he so overcame his sleepiness, he ended up, after that, only ever sleeping two hours a night. So it's, it's to take, take your cross and make it your victory. So he lived uh, for 14 years in this manner as an exemplary life as a Franciscan, <clears throat> which You know, by this time, the Franciscans are like 300 years old. They've been founded in, in the, the year of the early 1200s. And they had gotten kind of lax by then. And so uh, Peter is, Peter von Cantor is trying to revive the uh, original uh, fervor of the group. Um, and you know, he's meeting with some success. Uh, but he also becomes an um, effective preacher, especially to the poor. Uh, it says that he enjoyed preaching more to the poor than any other group. Uh, because it was so successful. They were so responsive. They had nothing else uh, to lose, right? And that's so frequently the block to sanctity, to responding to the call of the gospel, is possessions, right? We don't own our things, they own us. And that's why St. Peter had success among the poor. So eventually he's elected superior general of the Franciscan province, and this is in 1538, so he's almost 40 years old. And immediately he sets out to writing a reformed rule of the Franciscans. So he, 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 had, he had noticed these problems. He was quiet. He, he, he bided his time. Eventually he became, um, uh, again, provincial superior. So now he's going to take his opportunity and reform the Franciscans. However, when he proposes his, uh, uh, his designs, he met so much resistance and there was, there was such a hostility that he actually had to resign his post as superior despite the fact that he'd been elected. And so um, he'd spent all this time, you know, hoping for that chance to reform the Franciscans, and then now when, it, when he had it, it turned out um, it, wasn't, it was going to come to nothing. 
So he resigns his post, and actually he leaves the Franciscans for a while, and he goes off into the mountains, and now is where he lives as a hermit. And so he's strictly observing the hard, some very hard penances. He's soon joined by some other men who are um, uh, of, of a like mind, and a few small communities are formed. And he lived in this way for 15 years. 15 years he lived as a hermit. He was doing, um, you know, preaching sometimes, uh, most of the time in, in, in penance and prayer. Uh, but after this, after he's been 15 years, he's got some other people who have joined him. Uh, they convince him to go to Rome and get permission to uh, establish them as Franciscan communities according to his restored rules. So that's what he does. He, he travels to Rome uh, barefoot from Spain, and he, he meets the Pope, gets permission for his orders, and as soon as he does, he, he turns right back around, heads back to Spain, and he doesn't even wait. Along the way back to Spain, he starts founding Franciscan communities uh, along the way. Uh, he returns to his, um, his little community there. He establishes them as uh, reformed Franciscans. And he's so successful in, in this, in this uh, regards that an entirely new province of Franciscans is formed, according to his order. And then sure enough, underneath the superior um, general of the Franciscans, uh, that province is added and so that was his, um, his way of uh, reforming the Franciscans as a whole. And in this regard, he was um, an inspiration to others. As we recall, um, the Feast of St. Francis Borgia was not too long ago. Uh, he wrote to him, Francis Borgia wrote to him and said, um, your remarkable success is a special comfort to me, uh, just due to how many hardships he'd endured, being essentially forced to resign from his own community, spending 15 years as a hermit, and eventually, uh, uh, founding the Franciscan, or re reforming the Franciscans. Uh, he also wrote to, um, he had correspondence with St. Teresa of Avila, and he encouraged her in her efforts to reform the Carmelites, which we know she was the great reformer and founder of the Discalced Carmelites. And in fact, it's because of her, her interaction with him, uh, she would write about him. She'd wrote about um, uh, his life, his penances, and so on. That's actually how we know uh, um, anything about St. Peter, right, or at least as much as we do, was because of the writings of St. Teresa of Avila. Uh, she, would inf she was the one who informed us that he would only sleep two hours per night. Uh, also, uh, let's see, she, um, uh, in talking with him, she realized that he was experiencing uh, ecstasies in prayer. He was in the, those higher mansions. He was uh, seen to levitate, and he had the gift of prophecy, and also it was um, uh, said that he had the gift of miracles as well. It was common for him, St. Peter, uh, to take food uh, once every three days, and oftentimes he would go a week without eatings. And as we know, he, he would only sleep two hours a night. Uh, so definitely a very rigorous life, uh, tremendous penances, but it was St. Teresa of Avila who, who recorded those all down for us. And in her writings, as, as with St. Francis Borgia, she would say, um, I know of a priest who experiences, you know, uh, these mysteries and ecstasies in prayer and who has the mystical marriage. Uh, she talks both about Francis Borgia and Peter of Alcantara. Those are the two of the men that she says had reached the, um, the seventh mansions. Uh, he died even as he lived in, with extreme asceticism. His final uh, hours, and he died in uh, 1562, so he's about almost about 62, 63 years old. Uh, he had a terrible thirst in his last hours, uh, but he refused any water. Uh, saying that our Lord, even as our Lord thirsted on the cross, so he, would, he wanted to die experiencing that great thirst. And so thus passed St. Peter of Alcantara, as I mentioned. Uh, he began his life with the Franciscans, tried to reform it, didn't work, uh, retreated to the desert for 15 years, and then returned back to the Franciscans. And that, that would be difficult, right, in that he had, we know that he was um, uh, this brilliant uh, student and very capable but he left all that behind, right? The busyness of, of, of uh, governance, of being in charge, he left that behind. Uh, he went to the desert and lived a completely ascetic life for 15, 20 years, and then he went back to it. As an old man, he went back to the busyness of being in charge and taking care and so on. That's not easy to do, right? But that is what our Lord asks of us, right? Is whatever he puts in front of us, that's what he wants us uh, to work on. And he let, he, let him, he, let, he let himself be led by God, wherever that would be. Uh, the weather was to the desert, to the Franciscans, business correspondence, whatever. And so may, may us, uh, may we ask for that docility to leave the world behind if necessary or to enter into it, right, with detachment. Whatever God asks of us, let us be willing to do it. Uh, St. Peter of Alcantara, pray for us.
God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.